welcome. Glad to see so many smiling faces today. So we've got a great program, um, as well as our business meeting. If you haven't already, please turn off your cell phones or silence them. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn the meeting over to Gail to introduce our speaker for today. Okay, thank you. We are thrilled to have with us today Mel White, who is a nationally known author who writes for National Geographic, has written for National Geographic and many other very well-known publications. Uh, Mel has traveled the world to many, many exotic places and today he's going to be discussing butterflies. And his topic is How Butterflies Taught Me Botany. No? second time I've been to Hot Springs in the last 10 days. I came here to hear the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band at Oaklawn last Sunday. Do you guys go there? I can't hear you. second time to come to Hot Springs. I was here last a week ago Sunday to hear the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band at Oakland. Did anybody else go there? Yeah. Man, that's a great band. That's a fancy place too, I tell you what. I mean, who knew the casinos actually made money? I thought they gave people money. I guess they must actually make money. Anyway, uh, I'm happy to be here. I hope that uh, this is somewhat entertaining. I, uh, I, got hooked on birds when I was a little kid with my mother. She was a bird watcher. Check, check. I'll try to stand closer. When you do like this, that'll be it's too loud, right? Anyway, I got hooked on uh, birds when I was a little kid. And that's all I cared about for a long time. I didn't care about plants. I mean, or I didn't, I'm not saying I didn't care, but I, I wasn't interested in that. And then, uh, I guess about 25 years ago, I decided I wanted to learn how to learn butterflies. And it was very frustrating at first because there were no good books in those days. And, and uh, they assumed that you were going to collect, uh, catch butterflies and bring them home and look at them, you know, like under a magnifying glass. Well, then two things happened. One, some really good field guides came out. And two, uh, people developed close focus binoculars. They will focus down to four or five feet. And if you're going to study butterflies, you have to have, you know, you've got to spring for this, for these close focus binoculars. They let you get really, really close and study them. And then there's books that, that uh, will teach you identify butterflies uh, through binoculars. And this opened up a whole new world for me. I mean, there was like all, all these incredible creatures that I had ignored for all these years were out there. Um, and I started taking pictures of them. All these pictures you see are pictures I took, almost all of them in Arkansas. Um, and the, the little topic here was how butterflies taught me botany. Uh, and I'll explain that in just a second. Uh, first of all, we'll just talk about butterflies a little bit. Um, butterflies are part of a group called Lepidoptera, along with moths and these little things called skippers. And Lepido, lepido means scale and terra means wing. And uh, butterflies, the color comes from these little tiny scales. They're arranged like shingles on your roof. Like this. Each one of those little dots is a tiny, tiny little scale. And they're just in these rows overlapping exactly like shingles on a roof. And when they first come out of their chrysalis, 
they're all fresh and brand new and they look beautiful and they're shiny. Well, when they get really old, which is like two weeks, three weeks, <laughs> they've, they've lost a lot of their scales. And that's why you see some butterflies that just knock your eyes out. They're so beautiful. And you see the, the same species and it's very dull. It's because they've lost half their scales and just coming off. They're very fragile. Um, now, this is the part that's really important. I'm sure everybody in this room knows more about attracting butterflies with flowers than I do. But this is the part that a lot of people don't know about and I didn't think about for a long time, which is what makes the big difference is what does the caterpillar eat, not the adult butterfly. But our adult butterfly would go to, you know, anything, zinnia, butterfly weed, whatever. Um, but the caterpillars have this very special uh, requirement for what they eat. In fact, you could look at like an adult butterfly is just a way to create more caterpillars. The caterpillar is the really important part. And uh, since these are insects, they go through the same process. A, and that becomes a caterpillar. And then the caterpillar eats, 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 eats. <laughs> That's all it does is eat, eat, eat for weeks, sometimes months. And then it becomes a, then it becomes a pupa or chrysalis, whatever you want to call it. And then it comes out to be an adult butterfly. And they live just long enough to make more caterpillars. I mean, that's the purpose of an adult butterfly is just to lay eggs. Um, and so this is what I discovered was that that thing where it says food plant, that is the important thing. There are certain butterflies that they go only to one food plant. Uh, Lolly, you're nodding your head, you know this already. One of the great examples is um, zebra swallowtail lays its eggs on uh, pawpaw. And if you look at a map of where pawpaw grows and a map of where people find uh, uh, tiger swallowtail, I mean, uh, zebra swallowtails, they match perfectly because that's what they have to have pawpaws. So anyway, we're going to be talking about that a little bit. Um, see, and I, I, we're not going to get through this whole thing, but this is how butterflies are classified. Um, does this thing come loose? Okay, this might be better so I can look at the screen myself. Uh, these are some of the families of butterflies, and many of these you're familiar with. Some of them you may not be with me. Okay. So first we'll start with swallowtails. And this is one that probably everybody knows, uh, Eastern Tiger Swallowtail. There's a bunch of these all in the United States, Western Tiger. There's one called the Two-Tailed Swallowtail. They all look very similar. And ours that's here in Arkansas uh, lays its eggs mostly on black cherry and tulip tree. Um, although I think it does like other kinds of trees too, but those are the two main ones. And then we have, oh, this is the downside of the, uh, on the other, the uh, lower side of an eastern tiger swallowtail. Um, uh, this is a pipe vine swallowtail, uh, which is self-explanatory because it lays its eggs only on pipe vine. There's a place outside of Little Rock called Two Rivers Park that is overrun with pipe vine. And I've been there sometimes. I, went th I was there one day when, the, when a whole, I mean, hundreds of chrysalises hatched out into adult butterflies. And the weeds and things were just covered. And some of them hadn't, you know, when they first come out of the chrysalis, their wings are all crunched up. And they have to pump liquid into their wings to get them to come out. And they were all in different, um, this is the bottom side of the pipe vine swallowtail. One, I'm not going to do an ID thing here, but... Uh, one way you can tell these, it has one row of orange, like one circle. Some of the others have two rows. Uh, this is a spice bush swallowtail, which lays its eggs on, believe it or not, spice bush, and also sassafras. And this is a uh, giant swallowtail, which lays its eggs only on citrus. So you might say, why do they live in Arkansas? In, in Florida, these could be like a pest. They, they are so common that the caterpillars will like eat the leaves off all the trees in an orange grove, so they're considered a pest. Well, what are they doing here? We, we do, you, you, I'm sure you know, we have some things in the citrus family here. Uh, Xanthoxylum, the Hercules club, or toothache tree, is in citrus, and also um, hop tree is in the citrus. And so that's why we have the giant swallowtails here. Same thing, Two Rivers Park has lots of those uh, uh, devil, uh, Xanthoxylums out there, and so there's lots of uh, giant swallowtails out there. Uh, everybody's favorite zebra swallowtail, this is the one that lays its eggs on pawpaw. All right, now we're going to move on to the whites and the sulfurs, which are usually white or yellow. 
And this is one that you probably all are seeing right now. <laughs> Cloud is sulfur. They, um, they get really common in the, in the late summer and fall. And these guys lay their eggs on cassia, which is like a legume. Uh, it's kind of a weed thing that grows, like especially along river sandbars and things. Uh, this is uh, the, another view of a cloud of sulfur. The, some, of them, some of them have these large dots, and some of them don't, like you can see here. Uh, this is a tiny little butterfly called the dainty sulfur. And it's no bigger than your fingernail. I'm serious. It's like this is half the size of a postage stamp. But they're really cool. Uh, and they lay their eggs on daisies and asters. These are uh, called little yellows. It's not a very, you know, inventive name. They're little and they're yellow. Uh, but this brings up, uh, I'm going to get into the, just a slightly R-rated uh, topic here just for one second. Uh, when you see a bunch of butterflies, uh, doing this, which is called puddling, like on a, uh, a muddy, you know, like a dirt run up country or sandbar. They're all males. And what they're doing is gathering up minerals and, I don't know, five, whatever, essential stuff. <laughs> so to save it. And when they mate with the female, they don't just inject sperm. They inject this thing called a spermatophore, which is like this package of vitamins and minerals and things for the female. Why do they do that? So that the female can spend all her time laying eggs and not have to fly around feeding. So he sort of injects her with this, <laughs> like Major League Baseball and the PEDs and the, you know, all that stuff. Like they're injecting her <laughs> with these vitamins so she can spend all her time laying eggs and making eggs inside her body and laying them. So that's why when you see this uh, bunch of butterflies, they're all males. Uh, what's next? Very common butterfly. One of the first butterflies to come out in the spring, orange sulfur. And it uh, just lays its eggs on various legumes. This is a, looks very similar, but it has this kind of slash mark, uh, kind of a rusty slash mark on the hind wing. And this is called a sleepy orange. And the reason it's called sleepy is because many of these oranges and sulfur have those little round dots in the wing like open eyes, and this one doesn't, so they're claiming, they called it a sleepy. <laughs> uh, okay, I don't know if you can see this, but this is a cool butterfly. This is called a southern dog face. And I don't know if you can see this or not, but if you look up at the, uh, at the front forewing, can you see the, the shape of a dog's head and the nose and an eye? This is another uh, slightly better piece of what I'm talking about. Like there's a, a little forehead, it's like a poodle. A little forehead and a nose, and then the eye. This is uh, this looks a lot like some of those other yellow ones, but they this one has a pointy, pointy forewing too. Uh, where are we? Oh, this one, everybody's this is one of everybody's favorite butterflies. It's a tiny little thing that only it comes out only from like mid March into April. It's out, out for a very short time. Beautiful white butterfly with these brilliant orange tips, and it's called a falcate orange tip. And I took this picture one day near Conway, I bet you 20 years ago, and I have never gotten another good picture of this. They're so flitty, and they, they won't lie for more than a few seconds. So they're, I'm just, it was pure luck that I got this shot a long time ago. This is the underside, and that shows you how tiny this butterfly is. This is the underside of a falcate orange tip. And what, what they lay their eggs on um, crucifers, like mustard. Is that what a crucifer is? Mustard kind of thing. Uh, this is another really tiny, cool butterfly called an Olympia marble. I've seen this two times in my life. Once was at Lake Catherine State Park, and once was on one of the trails in the National Park near Hot Springs. Um, they come out really short time in the spring. I mean, they're out for maybe two weeks, and that's it. That shows you how important the caterpillar stage is and how adults are just a way to make more caterpillars, really. And also to provide enjoyment for us, of course. Checkered white, this is a butterfly that's really common more out west, but, um, but we get them here too. And it has this kind of oblong black thing on the forewing. 
This picture I took in uh, Louisiana. This is called a Great Southern White, and it's really cool because it has these just like iridescent go, uh, blue tips to the antenna. We, these, these do come into Arkansas a little bit, like if you're in now El Dorado or someplace like that, they'll show up occasionally, or Texarkana. Okay, there is <laughs> harvester. It's not plural because there's only one species in this family. And I, I love this butterfly. This is the only <laughs> carnivorous butterfly in North America. <laughs> not this, not the adult, but the caterpillars are the only caterpillar in Arkansas that doesn't eat plants. They eat aphids. <laughs> so, you, you know, when you say it's a carnivorous butterfly, oh, no, oh, chocolate. No. No, it's the, it's the caterpillar, and the only danger is if you're an ape. It's called a harvester. I'm sorry, I didn't say that. It's called a harvester. And I just think it's beautiful. I mean, the, the subtlety of those little circles and the, and the color. I mean, uh, a really good place to see these is uh, Lost Valley Trail up at Buffalo River, because there's a lot of aphids on that little creek there. Uh, but believe it or not, one showed up in my backyard three or four years ago. I mean, I couldn't believe it. I ran screaming into the house. To my wife, there's an harvester in our yard. <laughs> and I don't know if some of you know Dan Scheiman. He's the he's a big birder up in you know Dan. Well, he and he and Samantha. This was a jinx butterfly for them. They tried, they tried for years, I guess, to try to find a harvester, and they could never find one. And I'm, I just told him, hey, Dan, I had one in my backyard. <laughs> we only live about a mile apart. <laughs> Anybody who's a bird watcher knows the story of jinx, uh, jinx butterflies and things. Okay, where are we? Hair streaks. These are little butterflies that most people never notice. They're really small. They, when you just glance at them, really you think it's a little gray moth. But if you get a good look at them, they're beautiful. They're just like little jewels. Uh, and they're called hair streaks because they have little tail, little hair-like tails that stick out the back. Uh, See like that? And again, these, this thing is about the size of your thumbnail. Uh, these pictures blow it up and it makes it look like a monarch or something, but it's really small. This is a uh, banded hair streak, which is not very common. I've only seen it a few times in Arkansas. And it eats um, oaks and hickories. <laughs> Plenty of those around. Um, this is one of my favorite butterflies, coral hair streak. Uh, just so nice looking in those. This picture doesn't really do it justice. Those dots are really kind of like a brilliant red, orange, crimson when you see a good one, a nice fresh one. And I haven't seen this very many times. I think I took this picture up, uh, I don't know, in North Arkansas somewhere. So this is the butterfly that hooked me on butterflies. I finally, you know, I could say I had a, I finally got a good field guide and I got a pair of close focus binoculars and I went up to Hollow Bend to say, I'm, today I'm going to look at butterflies. And one of the first ones I saw was this thing. It's called a red banded hair streak. And I got a good look at it, and I just, I was hooked. I mean, it's so beautiful. That red is, it's just, again, it's, it, I wish I could crank up the red a little bit, because it's, it's just crimson blood red, and it's just beautiful. And when I saw that, I was, I realized I was hooked on butterflies at that point. Well, yes. the, the edging that sticks out the wing. Oh. Is that camouflage? No, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry I didn't mention that. It's a fake eye and antenna. Yeah. Oh. So when a dragonfly, not a dragonfly really, but if a bird, for instance, yeah. or a lizard, especially a lizard, <clears throat> tries to get it, it will think that's the head and it will yeah. bite off that little dot and those antenna, which are not antenna, oh. and the butterfly escapes. You can see them sometimes. You see one that's just got a hole there where it should have the antenna. I'm sorry, I'm glad you brought that up. I should have said that. But that's a great adaptation for to be to uh, you know prevent predation. Where are we? Uh, red banded hair streak. Uh, the interesting thing about this is it feeds on just rotting vegetation, anything, rotting leaves, rotting whatever. Um, so it's got plenty to eat, obviously, all the time. The coral, uh, this one. Uh, feeds on uh, black cherry and plum. Mm -hmm. This is the most common hair streak. You see this a lot. It's called a gray hair streak, and it uh, feeds on a lot of things. I mean, uh, you, 
can't even list all of them. Uh, okay, let's see, where are we? That's the top side of a gray hair streak. Okay, we have these little tiny butterflies in Arkansas called elfins. Um, and they, again, come out only uh, in, like, say, mid-March and into April. That's the only time you have a chance to see them. And this is called a Henry's elfin. And it uh, feed, lays its eggs on redwood, redbud, holly, and blueberry. And uh, I just pretty much, where I live, I won't see them around my house. I pretty much have to go over into the Ouachita Mountains to see these things. This is another one that got me hooked when I was first starting. This is called a juniper hair streak, and it's just so beautiful. Uh, this combination of kind of green, kind of uh, moss, lime green, whatever, and the, the brownish red and the white. And the, the pattern is just, you know, it's beautiful. And uh, the name is actually quite appropriate because it lays its eggs on red cedar, which is obviously a juniper, right? So it's called a juniper hair streak. Another view of it. Um, this one is called a white M hair streak, but actually somebody must have been looking at it the other way when they named it because it looks like a white W hair streak here. <laughs> um, it lays its eggs on oaks, and I've seen this in Arkansas. Well, I've seen it my whole life, maybe I think two or three times. It's I don't I don't know where they live, wherever it is. It ain't where I is. <laughs> This is a great favorite of everybody's. This is called a great purple hair streak, um, and it lays its eggs on mistletoe. So it's one of those that if you see one, I guarantee you, you can look up, and within 20 or 30 feet, there'll be mistletoe on a tree around. That's all they lay their eggs on. And everybody loves these, and they're just very hard to find. This is another one that, I mean, you could set off, you know, in April and start looking for these things, and you could spend the whole summer looking and never find one. They're just very hard to predict where they are. Uh, this is another one. <laughs> I was over in the Washtaws, uh, kind of west of Lake Sylvia one time, and I saw there was a, I don't know, a plum or something blooming, and I saw one of these, and I knew that Dan Chiman and Samantha had never seen one. So I called him, and, and I did exact direct, you know where Brown Creek is, you know where there's a little, there's a little lower bridge, and there's none, and they went over and they saw it, so that was great. <laughs> the nice thing about butterflies is, compared to birds, is they will sit still. Uh, I mean, not always. They'll just flit around. Sometimes you, you know, chase them for... But when they find a flower that they really like, or a patch of flowers, you can walk up there and practically shake hands with them because they'll, you know, they won't fly away. Many times. Uh, or... Blues. <laughs> Another good name, because many of them are, in fact, blue on the top, not the bottom one on the top. This is one that is super common, eastern tail blue, feeds on uh, Lespedeza. Uh, there's zillions and zillions. I mean, I don't know, this may be the most common butterfly in Arkansas for all I know. Um, you, you can walk sometimes down a trail with Lespedeza and they're just, they just fly up all around you. Uh, where are we? Uh, that's the top side of an eastern tail blue, which is why it's called a blue. And these are also, just like the hair streaks, they have the fake eye and the fake antenna to make things attack them in the, in the, in the rear, so to speak. Uh, this is a silvery blue, which is another butter, butterfly that comes out only for a short time in the spring. Um, uh, I think like, it depends on the weather, but like even as early as early March and on into April is when you can see these things. Uh, this is an interesting, you can see what it's feeding on there. Uh, this is a male obviously getting minerals from some bird poop. Uh, uh, this is a spring azure, and it's controversial taxonomy. They used to say that spring azure would come out in the spring, and then later in the summer they kind of changed form and they became the summer version of the spring azure. But then somebody decided that they were separate species, and then people are arguing about it, and I just sort of say it's a spring azure. <laughs> um, which also brings up something else. <laughs> I have the, 
the greatest picture I ever took, I think, of a, of a I think it was an Easter tiger swallowtail. I mean, it's on a big pile of dog poop, all right? And I, it's, there's no way to crop it. <laughs> I mean, I'm sparing you this picture, even though it's the best picture I ever took. But, the, you know, people are like, oh, God, I saw a cockroach in my kitchen. Oh, gross, cockroach. And then they're like, oh, look at the butterfly. <laughs> the butterfly, 10 minutes ago, was on a big pile of coyote poop out in the woods. <laughs> I mean, I'm, you know, that's PG-13, it's not really R, but anyway. <laughs> Where are we? Uh, oh, S Spring Azure. Uh, this is one that I don't even think is in Arkansas. I think I took this in Florida. It's called the Eastern Pygmy Blue. And I have a picture of it because I think it literally is the smallest butterfly in North America. I mean, it's the size of your little fingernail. That's, it's tiny. It's got these glittery things on the, on the hind wing. Uh, metal marks. Uh, I think there's some places in the country where metal marks can be seen pretty often, but they're very, very, very unusual in Arkansas. Uh, I've only seen them a very few times. This is a northern metal mark, and it has one food plant, and that food plant is uh, Senecio abovea, round-leaved something. <laughs> round-leaved something. Round leaf senecio or something. Ragwort, round leaf ragwort, senecio abovex. And several years ago, there was a big patch of this plant at Bell Slough uh, Wildlife Management Area near Conway. And somebody discovered that there was northern metal marks there. So we all ran there for, and took pictures and took pictures and saw them. And, and they, I think the next year they showed up and then they, they just disappeared. I mean, even though the plants are still there, some, the colony didn't survive. I don't know why. Um, we also have another kind of melomark in Arkansas. I've never seen it. I think it's called swamp melomark. And I don't know. I think they're over in western Arkansas, but I've never managed to see one. Uh, this is, okay, what do we got here? Okay, that's a, a male. And it's got this beautiful little, almost like, uh, Oh, uh, glitter, or not glitter, what do you call that stuff you put on Christmas trees, you know, like... Tinsel. <laughs> yeah, yeah, t like tinsel. It glitters, I mean, if you get a good looking one, they're just gorgeous. And there's a, that's a female. It's not quite as colorful, but it still has those little uh, tinsel things. Okay, this is a, just a total ringer. This is not found in Arkansas, but I, I'm proud of this picture, so I'm showing it to you. This is a blue metal mark that's found in the Rio Grande Valley of Texas. And if you want to see some really cool butterflies and you've got a long weekend or something, go down to McAllen or Alamo or one of those towns down there. They're, they've got incredible butterflies down there, just like birds. So don't look for this in your backyard. Uh, okay. I don't know what we'll do with time here, but we're getting to some cool ones here. <laughs> I'll try to go fast. Many of you probably know this, Great Spangled Fritillary. Um, you, they're pretty common in the... In the uh, in the Washtaws, some of you who live in Garland County probably maybe in your backyard. I don't, but some of you probably do. And um, many of these things lay their eggs. This lays its eggs on violets. That's the top side of one. Beautiful, beautiful, big butterfly. I mean, as big as a as big as a monarch. This is a, a one that Gulf Fritillary. It doesn't really nest that much in Arkansas. Maybe it does down in the extreme south, but. As the summer goes on, they just start moving north, and there's more and more and more of them until they get pretty common at some point. They're they're a brilliant orange with these uh, white dots, and the underside has this like psychedelic, uh, silvery, glittery pattern. And you can see those white dots there, and they lay their eggs on um, passion vine, may pop, um, and so does this one. I, I don't know why I love this butterfly. There's just something really cool about the, the subtle pattern of, of browns and the pattern. This is a, a variegated fritillary, and it's pretty common in Arkansas. And it also lays its eggs on passion fire. So, well, is there any reason why, I'm sure there is, that the top of a butterfly is so different than the bottom of the butterfly? You're out of my league at that point. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> There's some, some, Thank you. <laughs> sometimes it's too, for disguise. Like some of those blues, when they open their wings, which they don't do that much, you have to be really quick if you're going to get a picture of the top side of a blue or a hair streak or something. They're brilliant, brilliant blue. At least the males are. 
And when they close their wings, it's kind of boring gray with dots. So some of it's got to be for camouflage, you know. Uh, but as, as to why that, why this guy's beautiful on top and bottom, I don't know. I guess to get babes. I, 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 <laughs> That's, when you get down to nature, that's pretty much all it all is. You know, like, how can we make more of ourselves? Uh, again, I don't know why, this is one of my favorite butterflies. Variegated, fearlery, uh, passion vine. And then everybody knows this one, the state uh, butterfly of Arkansas, uh, Diana. Talk about sexual dimorphism. This is the extreme example. This is a male uh, that's brown, you know, kind of like brown and golden brown. And this is the female, which is great, big, beautiful, blue. Oh, I got it. Okay. So, turning the page back about 10 minutes, pipe vine swallowtail feeds on pipe vine. And pipe vine has, has some kind of, not exactly poison, but very distasteful chemical in it. I forget what it is. So if when the caterpillar, when the pipe vine swallowtail caterpillar feeds on pipe vine leaves, they get this junk in them, and people have seen blue jays grab a pipe vine swallowtail and spit it right out again because there's something nasty. <laughs> well, what's happened over time is that some butterflies that I'm not a you know evolutionary biologist, but it seems that many butterflies have evolved to look like pipe vine swallowtails even though they're not poisonous. And I forgot to mention, but stuff like, like um, uh, uh, spice bush swallowtail uh, and Diana, female Diana, uh, you could, if you were a dumb bird, you might think that was a pipe vine swallowtail and, and avoid it. Um, and the really cool thing is that the eastern tiger swallowtail, which I showed you before, you, you all know that one, the big yellow thing that's just huge. Uh, some eastern tiger swallowtail females are blue and black, dark blue and black. And they think it's, it's in the process of evolving, because females are way more valuable than males, to look like a pipe vine swallowtail, to avoid predation. And so we have, uh, I don't know what the percentage is, but a large percentage of female tiger swallowtails are not black and yellow. They're uh, dark blue and black. And people think it's to look like a pipe vine swallowtail. <laughs> okay, here's some cool ones. Uh, pearl crescent. If you're a butterfly photographer, you hate these things because they're so great. They're like this big, but they're really aggressive. And you're sitting there about to take the great picture of a harvester or something. Oh, this is going to be the best one. And boom, here comes a pearl crescent and chases it away. You know, <laughs> it's happened so many times. Uh, it lays its eggs on asters. This is a cool one. This is called a phaon crescent, P-H-A-O-N. And it lays its eggs on uh, phyla lanceolata, which is in the verbena family, which is called fog fruit. Some of you probably know that. It has little tiny white flowers, and it grows in wet areas. And that's the only thing it lays its eggs on. And again, if you see a phaon crescent, you can look around, and within 50 feet will be this fog fruit. Uh, silvery checker spot, it looks a lot like a really super common pearl crescent, uh, but it, it's a little bit bigger and those white, those dots along the rear wing have a white center. You have to look pretty hard to see that, but that's what the, that uh, shows you that it's a silvery checker spot. And then here's one I've only seen a few times in Arkansas. I think this took, I took this picture somewhere around El Dorado. This is a Gorgon checker spot. Um, lays its eggs on sunflowers, and it has this really weird psychedelic pattern on the hind wing there. There's all these swirls and dots and things. Okay, uh, American snout. <laughs> this is the only butterfly I think in Arkansas that has this really elongated proboscis, uh, and they're pretty common. Um, and they lay their eggs on um, hackberry. Uh, and apparently, I've read this, I've never seen it. Apparently, sometimes in South Texas, these things migrate by the, literally by the hundreds of thousands. And they say that there's so many of them that sometimes the roads, highways get slick with their bodies. There's so many of them. <laughs> okay, I'm going to hurry real quick here. Um, this is an American lady. Uh, there's, we have two kinds of, quote, ladies in Arkansas. And um, if you look at this, 
Well, maybe the next picture is better. Can you see how? There's like a notch at the fore. Okay, the, the forewing comes out and then it kind of makes, then it kind of makes a, a, a definite sort of notch. That's an American lady. And they also, one of the uh, sayings is American ladies have big eyes. So on the underside, it has two big eye spots. Well, not in the spring so much, but in late summer and in fall, we get a lot more of these, which are painted ladies. And um, they, the, it doesn't really have as much of a notch. It's more like a smooth curve from the forewing down, uh, from the tip of the, of the forewing on down to the back. And it has four little eyes instead of two big eyes. And this butterfly is found all over the world. Painted ladies are found in Europe, Africa, wherever. Uh, this is one I've only seen a very few times in Arkansas, or ever, wherever. Baltimore checker spot. This was taken up near the Buffalo River. And uh, that's because they lay their eggs on turtle head chelone, which I'm not a plant I'm super familiar with. But apparently, that's why you don't see them very often. Um, there's a bunch of butterflies called angle wings that uh, you can see why they're called angle wings. It's really just jagged and stuff. This is one of them that's called the question mark. And if you look carefully, there's a little curve with a dot. It looks like a question mark. And that's the top side of a question mark. This is the top side of a comma. Well, I don't have a, I guess I don't have a. The comma looks very much like this, except it doesn't have the little dot. It just has the curved white mark and not the little dot, so it looks like a comma. But if you look, if you look at this, well, um, that's too complicated. Never mind. Let's move along. This is the top side of a comma. <laughs> this is one they probably all get on to, Red Admiral. This is another butterfly that's found all over the world, uh, Africa, Asia. Uh, what is, where do they lay their eggs on? Nettles. Okay. Uh, common buckeye, beautiful butterfly, very hard to take a picture of, flits around, never stops. Um, they lay their eggs on dragon, on snapdragons and plantains. Uh, Gullweed leafwing. You know what gullweed is? It's a, uh, uh, what is gullweed? It's a uh, croton. Uh, they lay their eggs only on, on this croton plant. And they, it's called a leafwing because when it folds its wings, it looks just like a dead leaf. And when they open their wings, it's brilliant, brilliant orange. Like you'll be walking along and there'll be a bunch of dead leaves and suddenly this pop of orange just comes out out of nowhere. Very exciting. Um, and I, was, I, I could never get a picture when they were so flighty. I, you, you get within 10 feet, boom, they're gone. So I, I found this one out at Two Rivers Park and I'm sneaking up going, oh, I'm a little closer, a little closer. Oh, my. it was dead. <laughs> Anyway, there he is, <laughs> in memoriam. Okay, I'm gonna quit here in just a second. If you've ever had a butterfly, and I'm sure you have, down in the woods, land on your hand or your arm or your sweaty shirt, it's 99% of the time, it's this guy. It's, this is called a hackberry emperor. And it's another good name because they lay their eggs on hackberry, or sugarberry, where I live, sugarberry. Uh, and they love to get, yes, to your sweat, salt, minerals off your skin. And sometimes they won't even, like you can shake your arm and they won't go away. You have to like brush them off. This is the close relative called the Tawny uh, Emperor, uh, which is closely related and also lays its eggs on, um, on sugarberry and hackberry. Uh, I've never been able to get close to uh, morning cloak. Uh, so I swiped this off Norman Labor's uh, beautiful butterfly, kind of brownish with a bright yellow uh, uh, around the edge. Uh, there's an underside. Um, this is one of the few butterflies, most but adult butterflies live three weeks a month, a month old butterf adult butterfly is an old butterfly. There are a few that live longer. Morning cloaks sometimes will actually hibernate and also commas and question marks, which I showed you a second ago. They will find a niche in a dead tree or in your uh, a rotten board in your house or something and uh, spend the winter there, which is why on some really beautiful, sunny, warm days in January, you might see a butterfly. Mm -hmm. Most butterflies don't come out until late March at the earliest, but occasionally you'll see one of these guys come out because they're fooled into thinking that spring is here. Uh, okay, we're almost done here. I'm going to quit. Um, <laughs>
This is a, a red spotted purple, also known as a red spotted, spotted admiral. This is another butterfly that may have evolved to look like a pine vine swalltail so it wouldn't get eaten. Um, you can tell it from the other from the swalltails because none of the swalltails have red toward the tip of the wing like this one does. That's the bottom side of it. Uh, this is another ringer I just put it in because I like the picture. I took it down in the Rio Grande Valley. It's called the Malachite. Okay, three more and then we'll quit. Um, this is your everybody's favorite, the monarch. Uh, you know, like the six of milkweed. Everybody's worried about them as they should be. So we're all planting milkweed. Um, this is a male because it has enlarged veins right here. And those are scent producing. Those are scent producing glands, and there's a name for them, but I can't think of it right now. <laughs> uh, but anyway, they, you know, that butterflies have an incredible sense of smell, and so they, like females will come for miles around to smell those little dots on the, on the male. Uh, well, that's not really why they come, but it's, uh, This is at my brother-in-law's, my brother-in-law's house. Um, butterfly weed. I wish I could get those to grow in my yard, but I don't think we have enough sun. Uh, wonderful plant for attracting butterflies. This is a viceroy. You can tell it's a viceroy and not a monarch because it has this parallel line on the rear wing. Monarchs don't have that. Also, when monarchs, when you sometimes just see a, a butterfly just soaring, you know, like it's not flapping, it's just soaring. Monarchs hold their wings in a V, and viceroys hold their wings flat when they're soaring, which lets you remember that. No, it's not right. V is not for Viceroy, V is for the monarch. So it's not a good thing. This is a butterfly that is very common in Texas, and we only get them a little bit in extreme southern Arkansas called a queen. Uh, so, what time is it? I'll quit. Yeah. Okay. I hope, if you have any questions, uh, I hope it's something I know the answer to. <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, there are no good ones. Okay, the one that got me hooked was put out in 1999. It was called Butterflies Through Binoculars, and it was done by this guy named Jeffrey Glassberg, who, frankly, is a bit of a jerk and egomaniac. <laughs> I didn't say that, but uh, he is. Uh, but he put out this butter this book called Butterflies Through Binoculars, and that's. It, was, it just opened up a new world for me. It was the first butter book to have real pictures and say, here's how you tell a blah, for blah, 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 and tell you how to do it. It's out of print now. And you could probably find one on e eBay or 8 books or something for like 40 bucks. But I still recommend that if you're getting started. Okay, Glassberg, a few years ago, put out uh, this thing called the Swift Guide to Butterflies. Now, this is actually the first edition. There's a new edition. It's very frustrating. It's, it's a great book. It's got every butterfly in America in it. It's got good pictures of all of them. But he tried to cram, clam, cram 700 species of butterflies into a book the size of King James Bible, okay? And the pictures are squished up, and the print is tiny, and they're, it's just arranged goofy. So if you're a, it, it, I can see how a beginner would just get frustrated and just throw it against the wall. But if you really, it does work if you're willing to put the time in. And it's called The Swift Guide to Butterflies by uh, Jeffrey Glassberg. Also, Lori Spencer, some of you probably know, uh, she uh, has a book called Arkansas Butterflies and Moths. And almost all the pictures were taken by her husband, um, Don Simons, who has been an interpreter for the state parks for decades. Um, and then I, they, I would definitely recommend this book. This is the second edition. She had a first edition. Um, and this is the second edition. It's got, it's got good pictures of, of like almost all Arkansas uh, butterflies and a selection of Arkansas moths. 
Moths are, don't even get started on moths, man. There's 10,000 species of moths in North America, and they look alike, and... I mean, it's one thing to see a Luna moth, but no. And then, Ken, you know, many of you know Ken Kaufman, the super birder. He's put out field guides to birds and stuff. Here's his field guide to butterflies, and I'm going to recommend this, too, if you're getting started. Did that answer your question? I guess it did. <laughs> The author on the last one? Ken Kaufman. Ken Kaufman. Yeah, K-E-N-N. -N. Whatever. And, but I, really, if you were, if you, you, I, well, you might start with this one, Lori Simpson, because it doesn't have all the ones that are in South Texas and Florida and Nebraska. It just has Arkansas butterflies if you just want to get started. It's, and she did a good job. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Do you know of a good guide for identifying do you know a way to identify caterpillars? There's like 180,000 yes. of them. And yes. Is there a way to take that? There's a way. Of a caterpillar there's a way to get started. Them? It's the same. Well, it's called caterpillar through binoculars, and it's it's also Jeffrey Glassberg's thing. And it's I didn't bring them. Well, anyway, if you just Google that caterpillars through binoculars, and it, there's so many of them that you, there's no way that you can have all of them. But it's a really good getting started for for caterpillars. And the other thing is they go through instars. You know what an instar is? Like when a, when a caterpillar comes out of the egg, it looks a certain way, and then it kind of, and then it becomes another look, and it, and it comes out again, and it looks like different. So it's even more complicated than just. And, there, and the U.S. Forest Service also, I have a book, I don't know where I got it, uh, called Caterpillars of the Eastern Forest or something. And it's put out mostly so that people can tell the ones that uh, they're pests that just defoliate the woods. But somehow or other, I got that from the, I think it's the U.S. Forest Service that puts it out. So that's a start. Yes, ma'am? Uh, for us novices, can you give us a general dis explanation of the difference between a moth and a butterfly, please? Uh, moths, there's a bunch of difference. One of them is the, uh, you see the, the uh, antenna on this, uh, on this queen? It's a, it's a skinny little tube with a knob at the end. Moths have, many of them look like feathers. They have little, little plumy things along the edge, and they don't have a knob at the end. That's one big difference, and that's a lot. <laughs> they're, obviously, they're nocturnal, um, and they've evolved, you know. They, they, a lot of their evolution is to avoid that. Moths are basically bat food. They're bat, bat McNuggets. They're moth McNuggets for bats. <laughs> okay, I've gone on a really long time. I'm sorry. Thank you for putting up with my... <laughs> Lots of room to play in. 
And um, that's a, actually it's modern storage out there where the skating rink used to be. So that was fourteen hundred dollars, fourteen hundred seventy-four dollars, and it was in the budget. So those are some of the big expenses, and the scholarships have all been. The money has been put out there, sent to the colleges, so we have some happy students. Um, let's see, and so uh, it looks like in our general account we have $39,765.16, and that's as of the end of August. And then in our depository account, uh, the scholarships came out of that. We have $4,413.31. So our uh, cash funds available are $44,178.47. So um, also the um, income and expense report went out. And so that kind of shows you what has been spent out of your budgets. So please look through that. And we'll also be sending out the 2024 budget proposal that will be coming out and so look that over if you have any questions or want to add something to your budget you can give me a holler probably email or text would be best and we will vote on that then at our next meeting in october and i think that's it unless there's any questions yes Oh, sorry, that would be a good thing. It wasn't per month. So it's actually for 11 months. So we'll finish up with it right after the state conference. Good question, thanks. Anything else? Yes? How big is it? How do we get in? <laughs> <laughs> nah, I don't know about that. I, I don't know. I honestly don't know. Karen, that this particular storage unit is just for convention only. We are we are talking about one forever, but not this one. This one is just for convention. Eleven months, then it's gone. Yes. But because um, I think Karen's thinking the same way I am, um, there are many of us who have many projects, so we have our living room is plant sale and sig and you know, there. So at some point in time, there is a possibility of having a place because we understand that the new extension office does not have any space. There will be some place for us to keep. That is being discussed now in the executive committee. So we'll bring that back to you. present today and we have five guests. When I call your name, would you please stand up so we can recognize you? Jackie Fox Thomasy, <laughs> Dana Tyler Tipton, <laughs> Pepper Smith and her husband Todd Smith, <laughs> and Janice Rowe. Welcome. I have an hour to report. You may have noticed if when you're reporting your hours, there's a new category. It's the number one line item. It's called State Advanced Training Hours. That's where you will put in your state training. Um, and there's already a lot of you signed up for that, so we appreciate that. And the number one project, I bet you can't guess what it is. Land sale, guard show. 2,397 hours reported so far. Number two, Detention Center Learning Greenhouse, 1,545 hours. 
So we've been really busy, but there's a lot of you that still haven't put in any hours, so please do that before December 15th. So as of today, we have 14,302 work hours recorded, 4,808 education hours for a total of 19,111 hours worked. Good job. Thank you. Um, we do every year a project evaluation for all of the Master Gardener projects and the intent of that is to try to determine what's working and what's not working and where projects might need some help. We have had one project this year that has been somewhat overworked. Their project has grown and gotten too large and they are unable to continue to maintain it. And so what we're doing is splitting that project. Uh, the Farmer's Market uh, Triangle Project added a pollinator garden, as you recall, a few years back and it has become really an overload uh, in that area. And so what we are planning is to pull the pollinator garden out as a separate project for the future. It will, for the time being, be considered a work in progress, a non-sanctioned project until we can get it established, bring it back to the membership to vote on it to become a sanctioned project. Uh, we have two people that have stepped forward and are willing to chair that. Two Annettes, the two Annettes. <laughs> we have Annette Cheryl and Annette Gibson. Both of them are first year master gardeners. <laughs> uh, they have decided that they want to do pollinator garden on the first Thursday of the month. So mark your calendar. And if you are interested, uh, Annette and Annette, would y'all stand, please? Everybody, please, please. Okay, now they are recruiting. They are recruiting. They want people who want to learn more about pollinators or who have an interest already in pollinators and like to work in those types of gardens. They want you to sign up. There is sign-up sheets at the back where you can put your name, phone number, and email address. They will remind you of work days. They'll send you communication when there's something you need to know about that project. We want you to try to sign up today. They plan to get started in October. That will be their first work day at the new pollinator garden. So we want to say a huge thank you to our new chair and co-chair. And hope all of you will sign up and give them a good crew to work with on this project. All right, thanks, Dale. The next, uh, next up, our past president, Jody, on the mentors and the first year master gardener. So we had a meeting with the um, New Master Gardeners at the County Fair Preview on September 14th. We had eight New Master Gardeners and six mentors come out to see what the County Fair was all about. I think they had a great time um, and walked away with a much better understanding of how you bring your show plants to the fair and exactly what we do at the fair. And they had a, they had a great time. We had lunch out there as well. Uh, as far as hours go, we got three more certified since last month, um, so it brings our total to 13 of our Master Gardeners have become certified, earning enough hours. Ten more still need hours, and there may be, after the county fair, I didn't get a chance to look at the hours, so there may have been some of those ten that have become certified as well. And just a big congratulations to Diane Arrington. She has 200 hours. Let's give her a round of applause. Our final um, 
meeting for our new Master Gardeners will be on November 9th. Uh, details to follow. And I also want to let you know that we have some additional mas Master Gardener candidates that will be taking training starting on October 1st. I'm looking for a few mentors, so if you're interested, let me know. Um, Pepper Smith, uh, Trevor Crandall, uh, Josie Goodman, and Deborah Dorsey have all signed up to do electronic training. Again, that starts October 1st, and we give them six or eight weeks to finish, and then we'll kind of try and roll them into the program and see how that goes. It's a little new for all of us, uh, but I'm sure that we'll find them a home. Thank you. Any questions? Great. Right, um, Jimmy, our, our uh, county agent, well actually the chair, is not here today to report to us, so we'll just move on to unfinished business. Uh, Char is going to give us a little wrap up of the county fair. Thank you to um, Pam Stevens and Cheryl Volpert because if it wasn't for your guidance and your calming words, in Pam's words, Char, will you just chill out? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't know if we would have survived it, but Pamela and Vince and I, we had a lot of fun and um, look forward to next year, I think. Um, so I wanted to share some numbers with you, but after the 2,000 hours at the plant sale and the 1,000 at the detention center, a little humble, we had 522 hours of volunteer time. Um, we had a little over 1,910 votes for the Scarecrow contest. And I will tell you, if you need to get people um, hawking in for votes, Talk to Annette Gibson and Tony Atkinson. <laughs> Tony, at one point in time, I think it was a Tuesday night, she told somebody, she, as she was getting people to come into the building, hey, if you vote for my scarecrow, I can win that four by. <laughs> Funny, a guy came in on Saturday, comes up to the table and whispers, hey, which scarecrow is Tony's? I'm like, she didn't even enter a scarecrow. <laughs> So they're really good at that. Um, <laughs> school days, we had um, 289 kids come on school days, which was great. Um, Ann Ayers and Mary Wittenberg did a fantastic job on the compost um, kids' corner. And I have to say, not only were kids interested, but I think a lot of adults were very interested as well. Um, so all in all, we had a really good um, turnout. Um, and if you look here, um, <laughs> Mary Tom Taylor, Carol Scrubber, and Kay Adams did a fantastic job on sustainability. That was the theme of the fair. Um, and I can tell you right now, if you need your closets organized, call Carol and um, Kay because they help break down on Sunday. And many fair board members told us that the garage area where we put a lot of stuff never looked so good. So a special thank you. <laughs> um, you can see these little um, photo ops in the front. Um, Elaine Taylor did a wonderful job painting them, and Pam's, uh, Benz's husband made the stanchions, and they were a huge draw for kids. They would run into the building, and then um, Annette and Tony would get them to cast their votes. So <laughs> it worked out really well. Um, we had 15 booths set up, educational booths. Um, of course, Ask a Master Gardeners. Um, and then there you can just see a few different pictures. Um, again, Kids Day was a huge success, and I think next year we'll um, connect better. We have a new 4-H um, agent, so she'll connect better with us next year. But the kids and adults had a lot of fun with that. And our new Master Gardeners and mentors came out, as um, Jody said, to visit. And I think they did learn a lot about what we actually do at the county fair. And there's two really pretty daisies, or sunflowers, whatever they are. <laughs> and the grand prize winner of the Scarecrow Contest, Diane Arrington. So with the people who entered a Scarecrow, Diane
I am, please stand up. Um, Pam Benz, of course, did. Pam had a family emergency, so she's not here. Um, Karen Grisham and Susan Caney and Sharon Bennett. So I have a long plan for each of you. If you would come after the meeting, I was told by my seatmate to make it quick. So come and get a mom plan. We'd like you to have that. But um, again, a special thanks. Chris St. Peter um, stayed every night to help me shut down, turn off the lights, so I wasn't by myself. So there were so many people who did a lot of really good things, and it was a lot of fun. So um, hopefully next year we'll get more of you to participate. Thank you. Thank you. We're looking to get a lot of nominations like we did last year. It is so much fun to go through the list and see, you know, who your peers have nominated for these awards. So I really, really encourage you, please nominate. If you don't know one for every category and you just have one that you think is the best rookie of the year or mentor of the year, just nominate that person. We've got a couple different ways for you to do it, okay? So we have passed these out. This is the nomination form on the back. You can either uh, drop it off today. That'll be the last time that we'll have these at a meeting. Now, the online nomination form will be open until October 1, which is a Sunday. So you can either use this one or go online. Don't use both. But uh, you can actually use both in certain situations. Say like you filled out a few names and then you go home and you go, boy, I wish I'd nominate that person. Go to the online form and fill it out. Perfect. Send it in. We're going to input all of these uh, paper nominations. Um, into the electronic form just because it comes out with a really nice spreadsheet at the end of the nomination period. So let me find my notes. Uh, you don't have to vote in all categories, so please remember that. If you just got one person, vote for that person. Um, whys, why you voted for that person are so interesting and fun and they're really welcome. So if you don't have room to put it on this form or put it on the online form, email me. I have been printing these off. I've got some really heartfelt uh, nominations with pictures and letters about the person that they are nominating. And I think that makes it all the more special. So if you don't have room on the form, if you can't put it on the online, send it to me. I promise you it will get into our, our book. Um, let's see. That's really all, and I know it's hard, you know, people go, oh, I, don't, I don't know people, I don't know projects, I don't know. Look around the room, that's all you need to do. Look at who's at your projects. I mean, I've, I've worked the fair, i worked the kitchen. It is so much fun to get with people that are in our group and are there all the time, and you, you can if you think, if you just think a little bit, you can find one person or one thing to nominate. And I think we have to be very, very proud of our group. We are, we are a big group. We're a very well-recognized group. We have a, a very great reputation, and we do really, really well in these awards. And my team got together this week, and we are stoked. Uh, you know, we've got two new members in Pat Sisterhen and um, Susan Koenig. And so we are ready to roll. We won three of the last the awards that we won last year, we still have three people on the team that wrote those nominations. So let's, you know, come on kids, let's <laughs> nominate people. Let's get excited about it. Thank you very much. All right, Karen Grisham, our St. Patrick's Day Parade. We would build a float 
And uh, so we're going to be in the St. Patrick's Day Parade. And uh, we're going to publicize our plant sale. Set, write this date down. Uh, our first meeting uh, to show you what's going on and get the supplies to build this flow is October the 2nd, 10 o'clock at the Transportation Depot at the bus station and uh, in one of the meeting rooms. And uh, that address is 100 Broadway. And um, it's going to be a lot of fun. I know it's going to be a little bit of a hassle, um, but I'm going to suggest some things to bring because what we've got to do is um, sustainability. We're going to try to use what we have, uh, maybe something at home, and, and then see what we lack. And so we'll go from there. The theme for the flood is called Flowers of Ireland. And um, a lot of the flowers from Ireland are uh, also in Arkansas. So it will be kind of easy to find, find some things. And we're going to talk about the flood, the actual flow, how big it is, and uh, how we're going to build it the uh, October 2nd. So, October 2nd, anybody that wants to come, we want everybody that wants to participate to participate um, at any level. Uh, now, to be fair, we have to draw the names from a hat to see who's going to uh, actually be riding on the float because we have to do it safely. And uh, but we'll have people walk in on the sides. And so, uh, but we'll determine that on the second. Uh, things to bring with you. Get you a box. <laughs> uh, we need seeds of all types. Uh, I've been going to the dollar store and buying those little boxes of seeds that are on clearance and that 50 cents. Uh, but any kind of seeds that you have at home, put them in a, in a small envelope, label it, and bring it to our first meeting. Um, a measuring spoon. You don't have to all bring all these, but if you have, have them. Uh, we're going to measure the seeds and put them uh, in a packet. Uh, scissors, uh, a rotary cutter, if your friend, your uh, fingers are going to get tired of cutting, probably. Uh, but a rotary cutter if you have it, pink and shears if you have them. Uh, something to write with, bring a pen. Uh, label everything you have so it doesn't get mixed up or lost. Uh, Let's see, we need ribbon, and it can be fabric ribbon, it can be uh, like package ribbon for Christmas packages or birthday, any kind of ribbon at all, just to tie around the fabric. Um, bring fabric, tool, uh, little, somebody brought me some uh, little jewelry bags, um, though, anything. Anything at all. Uh, we're going to need white flat sheets. Uh, and you safety pin your, your name on them if you want them back. Um, but they're like in the quarter bin at the Salvation Army. I mean, just a white flat sheet because we're going to make bunting out of it around the trail. Uh, flowers, uh, artificial flowers. Uh, any kind, we're going we're gonna to need tons. Uh, garland, anything that you're not using, it can be old, uh, it can be from a thrift shop, it can be anywhere. Don't spend it, uh, any money if you can, you know, it's not necessary. But um, we're going, what we're going to do the first time is we're going to see what we have, see what we need, uh, get some volunteers to uh, be in charge of, say, red flowers or sheets or whatever. I've got three people on the committee. Uh, that is the, 
that's contact people besides myself. And uh, that's Marcia Smith, Donna Peebles, and Marianne Jarvis, who could not be here today. But uh, those are the people. We'll, we'll talk more about that later at the meeting. Um, we're going to teach, we're going to make packets of seeds with fabric, tie string around it. Oh, you don't, it doesn't have to be fabric. It can be uh, the white uh, coffee filters. Those will work. Uh, I, I, I don't have any because I've got the pods. But, uh, you know, if you have any, uh, that's a good way, you know, can do a lot with them. Uh, how to make packets, we'll make some. Uh, and that's something that uh, a lot of uh, people that need hours, new people uh, that still need a few hours or you, you haven't gotten your hours done, uh, you can do that from home or ask your friends or uh, get together like that. Um, And that's about it. Uh, yeah. Karen, yeah, it would be great. Since I'm an old lady, it would remember nothing. It would be great if you would put that list that you just read to us. I'll have Lynn put it on the newsletter and then we can all look at it. Yes, ma'am. Okay, I can do that. I'll, I'll do that. Yeah. Any more questions? Ten. What, what we can do is uh, put it in the newsletter. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Email. Email. Oh. Okay. Please. All right. On to new business. Uh, somebody already mentioned that we had the storage unit for um, the convention. Is there anything we need to add to that? No. Okay, so we'll just mark that one as covered already. So our last item uh, for new business is Marty Lynch is going to talk to us about the changes to the advanced training. I'm Marty Lynch and I work with County 76 on the advanced training project and the uh, Advanced Training Project has changed the uh, rules for uh, advanced training significantly. How many of you have attended an advanced <coughs> training class? Okay, thank you. Your classes are now changed to hours. They are not uh, designated as classes. And every class you have taken will be given eight hours credit. So the, there are five levels, one through five, so your level may have significantly increased. Um, the next change is, as Susie mentioned, you will now enter your own hours in the drop-downs menu where you enter your hours on the county level so that from now on you will be able to keep track of your own hours for advanced training so that you will know which level that you are at. The next change that has significantly improved is that new master gardeners who have finished their 40 hours and their 20 hours of education, even though they have not uh, finished their whole year, may now attend advanced training. And Diane Arrington, will you please stand, Diane? She has met those requirements, and she and I are going this afternoon to Crittenden County, Marion, where there is a new class that is going on underneath the new system, and it is for new for uh, advanced training for master gardeners, and it's also for the National Gardening Club. So it's a combination, which is a new uh, undertaking also. So there are many changes in advanced training that are very positive, and I hope that many of you will seek opportunities to attend some of the advanced training classes which are going to occur. If you have questions or comments, you can email me or text me. Thank you. All right, we have one additional add-in here that didn't make it in time for the agenda, but Tricia has a couple things she wants to say about the uh, state convention.
Hi, I'm Trisha Freeman. I'm in the, the chair for the 2024 state conference. And I want to give you a quick update. We have selected our garden tours. There are 16 homes that have agreed. Um, we've figured out our pre-conference tour. We've got some wonderful speakers. Um, those are set. We're still working on the goodie bags or what are we going to sell. But one of the things we're working on that's really important is sponsorships, donations from companies and individuals. Um, and Claudette has done an excellent job of going out to Hot Springs and trying to meet people and get them interested. Randy Ford said, companies give to people they know. So I'm asking you, if you know people in a company, whether it's your nail person or, you know, some big bank, whatever, please contact Claudette and maybe together y'all can get some money. Because what we do with this money um, we want it by December 1st. So, January 1, we go, okay, this conference is going to cost this much. So we'll take away the amount that we've raised so we can reduce the cost of the registration so more people can come if it's not that expensive. So, I would ramble on some more, but there are people in the back that are kind of... <laughs> Ready to go. So um, anyway, if you got questions, contact Claudette, contact me, Paula Jackson. Um, but it's going to be a wonderful conference. Alright, we're almost there. A few more minutes. Um, Diane Harden asked me to announce that uh, they're getting ready just to uh, start looking at the scholarships for next year and she would like to have a couple new people on her team so if you're interested in that please contact Diane Harden um, so until as usual they've done a great job over there with our and uh, butterflies and pollinators which fit very nicely with today's program no um, candy <laughs> no candy sorry <laughs> And as you can see, the other announcement is uh, we're working on getting our slate of officers for next year. Um, if you are interested or you know someone who's interested, contact Sherry Matthews. And even though um, we're not replacing our treasurer this coming year, um, Denise would like someone who has some accounting background that might be interested to start working with her now. So that by next year, 2025, she'll be our treasurer through 24. But by 25, you'll have a very good handle on what's going on and how to do it. Okay? All right. So that brings us to our drawing. Donise Kiner? There you go. Questions or comments or we're done. Nope. We're adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>